morning and welcome to City Church. My name is Mark and this is Chris and Christine. And uh, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, we're going to start out by reading from Psalm 103 for our call to worship. Let's read this together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his many benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does, his, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Let's pray together. O most gracious Father, help us this morning to honor the call to bless your name. Thank you for forgiving us of our iniquity through the work of Christ's blood shed for us. Thank you that in your mercy and grace, you made a way for us to be reconciled to you. May our faith be made strong by recounting your marvelous deeds. May we remember how compassionate you are. We ask you to show us your compassion now by helping us experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in this service. Help us to worship you today. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's sing Good, Good Father together. stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. Searching for answers only you provide Cause you know just what we need before we say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am Hardly 
you speak peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love
working on my fruit of the spirit plant. I'm not sure you're going to get much fruit from this one. It looks kind of dead. Oh, <laughs> it's just a prop, actually, that I'm going to use to hang the different fruits of the spirit on. But you do make me think of something. In Ephesians, we learn that while we were dead in our trespasses and sin, Christ died for us. And when we accept him as our Savior, he brings new life into us. Doesn't the Bible say we become reborn when we're Christians? It does. It sure does. Uh, but how do we know? Well, when a person is a Christian, only God really knows what's in our heart. But there are actions that we can show that show we are truly born again. And they are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to decorate this tree with what looks like fruits of the Spirit and talk about them each week with the boys and girls. Boys and girls, I hope you tune in to learn about each of the fruits of the Spirit. Good morning, City Church. Thanks for joining us online this morning. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors, and it's a joy to get to worship with you online. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, city Church seeks to be an authentic community that's walking with God in our city, and that's our prayer for our ministry. That's been our prayer from the beginning, and we pray that you experience that in this time of worship this morning. Uh, we have a connection card, which is a way that you can let us know that you you joined us. Um, if you would like to get more information about the church, if you'd like to get plugged in with anything, or if you have a prayer request, our staff takes time each week to pray through all those requests, and we'd really love to hear from you. So we encourage you to go online, citychurchgnv.com slash connection, and fill out that form, and, and that will get sent to us. Uh, we worship a generous God, and part of our expression of worship is to give generously as well. If you're a part of this church, if you're a visitor, this, you know, this is not for you. This is just enjoy worshiping online and, and watching the service. But if you're regular here and you're a part of this body, then we encourage you to, to give generously. You can do that online as well at uh, citychurchgnv.com slash give. A couple of announcements for you. Our community groups are meeting again. Uh, most of them are meeting through some combination of in-person outdoors uh, for some of the smaller gatherings or online through Zoom. Um, and so if you are interested in getting plugged in with a community that meets in, in that format, I encourage you to check that out. You can get information about all of our CGs on our website and contact leaders, uh, find their contact information there as well. Another announcement, we have a missions Bible study that is going to be starting October 7th, Wednesday, October 7th at 6.30 p.m. I believe it's a five-week study, and they're going to be meeting outdoors as well. There are several spots still available, and so if that's something you are interested in uh, participating in and learning more about, then please, uh, please let us know about that. You can email us. Uh, you can email the church email address at info at citychurchgmv.com or you can RSVP on our social media app, Realm. Uh, and if you are not on Realm, that's, our, that, that's a way that we do a lot of our communication around the church, then please do email us at that church uh, address and let us know that you'd like to get connected and we will get you signed up for that. All right, we are continuing our series in the book of Mark, and we are in the second half of Mark 13 this morning to encourage you to Pull out your Bibles and read along or follow along with the, the passage on your screen. Mark 13, starting in verse 14. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days. 
pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders and lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth, to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of getting to open your word. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your voice and take it into the depths of of our souls, and trust you with all of our heart. We pray that you would meet us here this morning or whenever we're listening, that your spirit would be powerfully at work in our hearts and in our lives, and that you would give us ears to hear, eyes that see, hearts that understand and trust you. Would you teach us, our, teach us your ways, O Lord, and show us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us, we pray. In Christ's name. Amen. Well, growing up in a military town, uh, I had a lot of friends in the armed service, you know, family members who were in the armed service. And so it wasn't uncommon to have friends or family members, uh, friends of their, of, of those family members of those friends who had loved ones who were on deployment, who were on TBY. And it can be really hard, you know, it can be a really challenging and difficult season for people. Uh, but it's, it was always really sweet to watch their care as they would count down the days to when their spouse or their parent or their sibling would return. You know, they'd circle the, the date on the calendar, they'd be crossing off the dates each day that would go by, looking forward to that day when they're coming back. Uh, they would get gifts together, They'd be sending care packages all along the way, but they'd be gathering gifts for them for when they'd come back. They'd pl- maybe plan some kind of party for when they got back. They'd clean the house, you know, prepare their favorite meal, do all of this stuff. And it's all leading up to this day when eventually their loved one returns. And it's just, to me, it's just such a beautiful picture of love and waiting going together. What would it be like if we lived as if Jesus was returning at any moment, if we lived like Jesus was coming back at any moment, if we had that same kind of eagerness for him to return, if we were busy preparing, thinking about him, doing, you know, doing the things that we knew would make him glad when he came back and he saw us. 
as we see in the passage today, we do have this promise that Jesus is coming back. He is returning one day. And we have this, the, the greatest loved one ever returning to us. And we should live like it could be at any moment. At any moment. Our call to action is this. Live like you will soon be with Jesus. Live like you will soon be with Jesus. And like he will soon be here with us. So how can we do that? Well, we, we see Jesus outline three ways that we can live expectantly for him to return here in this passage. To prepare, to hope, and to watch. To prepare, hope, and and to watch. So first, prepare for hardship. Prepare for hardship. There are hard times coming. Uh, There's no avoiding it. Jesus warns us plain and simple that our time of waiting for him will not be easy. He tells us here and elsewhere that Christians should expect difficulties in life. And Chipper covered this some in last week's message. If you didn't get to listen to that, I encourage you to go back and and take a listen to that. Uh, But Jesus warns his disciples that there is is some terrible future event coming here in the second part of this passage, kind of continuing that theme, that there's this second, uh, there's this terrible future event coming that would be triggered by what he calls an abomination of desolation being in a place where it shouldn't be. And he says, uh, when this happens, that his disciples in Judea should immediately flee from the city to the mountains. They shouldn't go back into the house to get their things. They should just run as fast as they can. So what on earth is Jesus talking about here, this abomination of desolation? You know, a lot of ink has been spilled trying to identify the referent here, and there's a lot of opinions about this passage Um, As I was reading through, combing through all of that stuff this week, I was secretly praying that the Lord would return before I had to preach this passage. But here we are, uh, nonetheless. And, you know, a lot of this has to do with, you know, the way that you interpret this passage may have to do with some of your theology about the end times. So I, I recognize that there may be different understandings about this passage. But the most persuasive take on it to me is that Jesus is predicting this impending destruction of Jerusalem. It's coming soon. There's in, a, in AD 67, there was a Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire, and then there was kind of, a, over the course of two or three years, there were some skirmishes, and then there was kind of a swift destruction of Jerusalem. And Josephus, the Jewish first century historian, reports that that during that, that period of war there, there were over 1.1 million Jews that were killed by the Romans and 97,000 or more that were enslaved as a result of that. This ma- the massive temple that they're looking at here in this passage, they're, they're looking at the, the, the temple here, this massive temple that has taken decades to build was just completely leveled and the Israelites were scattered. And this is what Jesus is referring to when he says that this generation will not pass away until all these things have come to pass. He's talking about this event that's going to come in about 40 years from their time that's going to absolutely destroy uh, Jerusalem and scatter the Israelites. But Jesus was also warning that there was another event coming that would come in the future and that this destruction of Jerusalem would foreshadow. There was, it was a second fulfillment of, of this prophecy here, and it would come in those days. There's a, a contrast here between all these things and in those days, and when he's talking about in those days, he's meaning the end of the end times, the end times being the time that the church, the church age, right, and the end, time, the end of that being the end of that age. So he calls this period a tribulation, that it would be unparalleled in its horror throughout all of history. Uh, And Jesus describes it as so horrible that unless the Lord intervenes, no human beings would survive. It will be something cataclysmic, something destructive. It'll be a great danger to the church, not only physical 
danger in the form of, of persecution and rejection, but also spiritual danger in the form of deception, that there's going to be these false Christs and false prophets who are going to lead a lot of people astray and even tempt the sincere followers of Jesus to trust in them rather to, than to trust in Christ. So the short-term warning uh, was fulfilled in the first century, but then there was this longer-term, greater warning that is still one that the church awaits fulfillment. Because of that, followers of Jesus should expect hardship. Followers of Jesus today should expect hardship. But do we expect hardship? Or do we expect something else in our life? You know, we live in a wonderful country. We live during an amazing period in the history of the world. I mean, we live in a world where there are airplanes and there's air conditioning, which I don't know how anyone would live in Florida without air conditioning right now. We live in a world with Chick-fil-A and Cheesecake Factory. Uh, You know, we have constant access to nearly endless information on this little device that slips in our pockets. Uh, We can write something and communicate it with the entire planet, to the entire planet. I mean, do you know how insane that is? It was not that long ago that was not possible. Life has not been like that for this long. Are there problems in our country and in our world? Yes, there's there's tons of problems, but it is still an amazing time to be alive, and all of those things are gifts from God for which we should be grateful every day. But, you know, there's also a dark side to all of that for Christians. Things like consumerism and individualism can breed in us this this expectation and even an entitlement for a life of success, a life of ease, a life of, of wealth, a life of comfort. Things that if we're not careful, can be destructive to the Christian soul. You know, one effective misdirection military strategy that's been used for uh, millennia is that of an ambush. The enemy lines up for battle on one front in front of you. Maybe they have fewer uh, soldiers out there. And after a while, they start retreating. You think, we're winning, we're winning. You know, you you chase them in pursuit. All the, all the men run out of the city and chase these troops. And then a little bit later, you start to smell some smoke. You turn around and you see that your city is on fire because the, they had set an ambush from behind. These troops had snuck in from behind you and destroyed your city. Often the church has been guilty of falling for this by thinking that our battle, that the battle is a battle over some culture war issue or some political party or something like that. And that's not to say that those things are unimportant. We should care about, uh, we should care about them. We should practice civic engagement and all that. But the real danger, the, the existential danger to the church is not those things. The existential danger to the church is conformity. It's conformity. It's acquiescing to the values and beliefs and behaviors of this world. The real danger is a church that gradually, slowly exchanges a life of radical, hard, sacrificial discipleship to Jesus for one of a quiet, comfortable, pain-avoiding, non-controversial conformity to the world. But that's not who Jesus made us to be, and that's not what Jesus has called us to. He said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the preserving agent in this world. You're the spice that gives this flavor of life. You're to be salty. You're to, you are to stand out. You're to be different. You're to proclaim the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God. You're to be holy. You have a kingdom focus in all of life that is this beacon of light in a dark and dying world. And so if we are going to actually be salt, we must be mentally prepared for hardship. Jesus warned us not only here, but elsewhere about it. He says, in this world, you will have trouble, 
But take heart, for I've overcome the world. You will have trouble. It's a guarantee for us. But the comfort that we cling to is not in worldly pleasures. It's not in creating some kind of comfortable life for us here on earth. The comfort that we cling to is in knowing that God is watching over his people through it all. Through all of it, he is watching over us. Jesus said here, for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. In warning about this great tribulation, Jesus reassures his disciples that God would be watching over them. Jesus promises to never leave us, to never forsake us. He's advocating and interceding for us right now, right this very moment, in the presence of God the Father. And the Lord watches over his people. Through good times and through hard times, he is near to us. You know, the imagery of Psalm 23 of the Lord as our shepherd has just been especially meaningful to me over these last six months as our country has responded to this pandemic. You know, in the midst of uncertainty and fear, the possibility of illness, David's words about the Lord are just a balm to our souls. He says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us. Even in the greatest hardship, he is with us. So we as Christians, as we wait for his coming, we should prepare for hardship, but we should know that we never face it alone. So we prepare for hardship, but secondly, we wait with hope. We wait with hope. You know, our souls ache and long for something. We ache and long for something. We strive, we work, we learn, we play, we build, we travel. And all of this with this pining after something, no matter how hard we try, the the itch of our soul is never really scratched. It's never really satisfied. You know, you 2 in their hit song uh, says it well. He says, I've, I've, I've climbed the highest mountains. I've run through the fields. I've run. I've crawled. I've scaled these, city, these cities' walls only to be with you. Only to be with you. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. They capture the, the personal nature of this yearning for our souls. We long for fulfillment, for life, for joy, for happiness. And we often long to find that in a person. You know, we think that if we just find the right romantic partner, then we'll be fulfilled. And so we put tons of energy and effort and time and emphasis on finding that person and, and dating them and, and engagement and then planning some extravagant wedding. And we think that, you know, when we walk down the aisle, when, when our bride walks down the aisle to us, that all our dreams and our longings are going to be fulfilled, right? But the reality is that even if you, you do get married, no matter how amazing that spouse is, that that ultimate ache in your soul will still be there. It will still be there. Because we do not just long for a person, we long for the person that made us. We long for our creator. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, For God God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in the face of Jesus Christ, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You see, the yearning of our hearts is really to see Jesus. 
And Jesus tells us here, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. All, all the other lights will go dim. Everything else will go dim. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. There's coming a day when Jesus will return. There's coming a day when Jesus will return. There's coming a day when Jesus will return. The tribulation will end. All the hardship and the pain and the suffering of the past will be gone. There will be these cosmic events, the likes of which no one has ever seen. The sun and the moon and the stars and all the heavens will be changed. They'll go dim. There will be this great darkness and then suddenly a light will appear. Brilliant, blinding, filling the sky. And then we will see him. We will see Jesus robed in majesty and glory, lifted high. And him whom we have trusted, who, who we have held fast to, we will finally see face to face. And he will send his angels to gather every one of his people, living and deceased in heaven and on earth from the four corners of the earth. And he will bring them all together to himself. So although we wait right now, we wait with hope. Because the, and the hope and the joy of our hearts is this, that we will be with him. We will be with him. One day we will see his face. And we will behold the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in him. And the longing of our souls will finally and eternally be satisfied. That is our blessed hope, not wishful thinking, but the anchor for our souls, firm and secure. And so now, as we wait, wait with hope. When you don't know how things are going to turn out in your family, wait with hope. When you feel unsure about your future, wait with hope. When you face tempt temptation or struggle, wait with hope. When you feel depressed or you feel like a failure, wait with hope. Wait with hope that he is watching over you and that one day you will be with him and he will make all things right. Whoever trusts in him will find fulfillment, life, and love in the arms of their Savior. And so we prepare for hardship. We wait with hope. And finally, we watch with care. We must keep watch. Jesus tells the story of the master who leaves his servants in charge while he goes off on a trip. And he tells them that he's, he's coming back soon, but they don't know when, and so he leaves the servants in charge of his estate. Now, imagine they anticipate that he's coming back for a while. You know, they're, they're dutiful for a little while, and they keep waiting, they keep waiting, and they don't... He, he's not coming back. And so they kind of, they just adjust to the new normal of him not being around. They kind of get apathetic. They kind of get lazy. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Or maybe they get a little cynical or jaded, saying like, man, he left us here to do all this work. He never came back to us. Or maybe they, got, they get skeptical and they say, oh, he's never coming back. He hasn't, he hasn't been here in ages. He's never coming back. Or they get distracted with all the pleasures and activities and the fun things to do in his property. Well, then one day the master comes home, and what does he find? He finds, all the, he, he finds that all the servants haven't been doing their duties. The house is a wreck. There's cheese puffs and solo cups strewn about everywhere. They're asleep on the couch. And it is not going to be a good day for them. Jesus tells us 
be on guard. Keep awake. Stay awake. And he places particular emphasis on the role of the doorkeeper here, whose responsibility would have been to watch for the master and to welcome them in, to call everyone to come and welcome this master, and the doorkeeper was to watch. And he, he tells his servants, and he tells us, keep watch. Stay awake. Don't get lazy. Don't get apathetic. Don't get cynical or skeptical about his return. Don't get distracted with other things. Keep watch. Keep your eyes open. Stay awake because one day he will return. So how do we keep watch? What does it look like for us to keep watch right now? In Matthew's parallel account to this text, Jesus uh, follows this teaching with two parables, the ten virgins and the talents, which both emphasize uh, being attentive to the stewardship that servants have been entrusted with, right? And after that, Jesus describes the final judgment when he returns, what it's going to be like, how things are going to go down. He will gather everyone to him, and he will separate them into two groups, those on his right and those on his left. And the distinguishing criteria between them is not merely that they profess to believe in him, that they call him Lord, but whether or not that belief was lived out in their lives, whether it was manifested and expressed in love for others, especially for fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He says that the the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger? welcome you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these my brothers, you did unto me. The way to watch with care is not only to remember Christ and to hold fast to his promises. Yes, we do that. But to be faithful servants while he is away. To pour ourselves out in love and good works to our neighbors. To care for those in need, especially those in the household of God. To diligently make disciples who are equipped to make other disciples. To faithfully share the good news of Christ our Savior with those who have never heard it. To use every gift, every status, every opportunity for his name and for his kingdom and to give him all the glory that he is due. And in doing that, we serve Christ and show Christ to others while we wait and we watch for the day when we will see him fully. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. You know, over the past few years, I've watched several friends, loved ones, uh, many heroes of mine go through various battles with illness. And I've heard a consistent theme from them as they fought cancer or some other ailment. You know, they say, this is terrible. I wouldn't wish this thing on anyone. But... What it has brought about, the, the intimacy with God, the sense of his love and of his presence with me, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Experiencing hardships, going through seasons of pain, sitting in times of waiting can sober us and remind us both of how near Christ is to us and how near we are to seeing Christ one day. Christ endured the deepest pain, the greatest suffering, the most agonizing waiting, all voluntarily for us. 
He was the most faithful servant, and yet he endured the cross and all our sin and all our shame so that by his sacrifice, we could be forgiven and we could live eternally in God's presence. What a Savior. If, if you haven't yet before, would you trust him? Would you trust him this morning? And if you do, live like you will be with him soon. Amen. Each week at City Church, we practice the Lord's Supper. It's a way for us to remember Christ's body broken for us and his blood shed for us, the cost for our salvation. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, uh, he had a meal with his disciples. And during that meal, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Later on during the meal, he took the cup and pouring it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul writes that, um, that as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, that we're remembering Christ's sacrifice, that we're actively putting our trust in him in that moment, and we're looking ahead to the day when he will return and we'll be with him again. A few words of instruction for you. Um, since you're doing this at home, feel free to just find whatever is closest to bread and juice around your house, crackers and, uh, and juice, whatever you, know, whatever you can find. Just feel free to use that. If you're celebrating with someone else, we encourage you to uh, to worship along with them by presenting the, the bread and saying, this is Christ's body broken for you, or this is his blood shed for you. It's just a way of ministering to one another. Um, and this is for anyone who's a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be a member at City Church or anything like that. If you profess to follow Christ, then you're welcome to participate in this. Um, and if you're watching along and that doesn't describe you yet, then we're just thrilled that you're taking the time to listen to this and, and we just encourage you to use this time to maybe reflect on the message and reflect on if, if this is something that you would like to receive to yourself. And if so, we would love to have conversations with you about that. Um, please reach out to us and let us know that. Also, if there's anything that we can be praying for you about, I mentioned this earlier with regards to the connection card, but if there's anything that we can pray for you about, please do let us know. We would love to, uh, to pray for you. Uh, let's pray now. Lord, thank you for this gift, uh, this very physical, tangible reminder of your body broken and your blood shed for us, the cost of our salvation. Pray that this time would be nourishing to our faith. Uh, thank you that we wait in hope right now as we look ahead to your return. And so, Lord, encourage us each wherever we are right now in our faith journeys, encourage us to trust in you, to fix our gaze on you, and to find in you the satisfaction of our souls. We love you, Lord. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.
Church, thanks again for joining us this morning for worship. Our benediction this morning comes from Titus 2, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Amen. Would you join with us in singing the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 